You know, many people have perished because they missed the caribou migration by about a week up here in the Arctic. I'm probably about two weeks early on the Arctic char running up this river, and uh, I'm paying for it with an empty belly. long months here in the high Arctic, the ocean is frozen solid. And in the summer, and even using that term summer is a bit of a stretch, there's a short period of time where the land is finally allowed to breathe. When the snow and ice finally retreat, researchers from all over the world come here to study narwhal, polar bear, and even killer whales. Every year, there are stories of people who get stranded. Even the local Inuit get lost and have to survive out here. The weather can come in hard and lock you in from traveling home for weeks on end. So I'm here to survive alone, without food, with very little gear and no camera crew in the Arctic tundra. I'm on northern Baffin Island, where every month is a new season. At 72 degrees north latitude, the sun remains in the sky nearly 24 hours a day this time of year. The ocean might have thawed that it remains cold enough to kill you within minutes of complete immersion. It's a harsh and unforgiving land. I've left the research team on the rock and being boated into a remote location for my own challenge. Any travel in this region is long distance travel. Right now, most of it's done by boat over the deadly cold Arctic waters. Just as it would play out with an actual researcher, I've given myself a few items to survive with. Fishing tackle, a two-way radio, battery, a small handful of whale blubber given to me by my Inuit guide, and a collapsible canoe. The spot I've chosen is a prime fishing area for Arctic char, but they only run here once a year, and like the caribou herds, if you miss the run, you can starve to death in an area that otherwise teems with life. Well, at least I'm left with this survival suit. That'll help keep me warm. Even just trying to get out here, we had to put up with two solid days of strong winds and rain. And it actually delayed me getting out to this spot coming from our base camp. But I'm in it now. Wherever I end up having to survive, I've got to set myself a list of priorities. In a place like this, it's going to be shelter. I'm extremely exposed here. The wind is blowing in hard, it's cold off the water, and it could rain on me at any moment. It could also turn to snow. All I really have to work with in this old fishing camp is that shack behind me there. And there's no roof. It never fails to bring me down a little, this worldwide juxtaposition of ocean refuse and ocean beauty. That's pretty gross. It's all rotting and filled with mold on the inside here, so I don't think this is the spot. Lots of junk around here. Might as well make use of it. This will help. It's not hard to find refuse on the shores of all the world's oceans. The advantage is, of course, that without it, I'd be reduced to hiding behind a small hill somewhere to get out of the wind. Well, it's a wind block and a rain block. And that's what I need. I have lots of breeze coming through here, but start. So here I am sitting in the middle of the Arctic, eating whale blubber from a narwhal going in gift given to me by the Inuit hunter that was training me out here. Now, the problem with this whale blubber and the skin is that <laughs> the smell of it is basically a dinner bell for polar bears. 
Mmm. Raw whale blubber and skin. In polar bear territory. This feels kind of like deja vu. I don't know that this is a smart thing to be doing. Well, I'm sleeping with a gun beside me tonight. Loaded. Hopefully I won't have any issues with polar bears at all. I'm sleeping on top of the floater suit. I'll put it on if I get cold enough. It's actually quite cold here. It looks beautiful, but the wind coming off that ocean is really cold. I don't need to use night vision on the camera at all because uh, it's 24 hours of daylight. I don't think I can stay here too long. Uh, it's The wind is really pushing in here. Uh, it's hard to fish on the ocean side here just because the waves are so big. Just got to get through tonight. Wind and the Arctic go hand in hand. Small canoes can be useless in a place with frigid waters, big waves, and relentless winds. I'm alone out here. If I were to capsize, I'd be in more trouble than I even care to think about. Man, it's so windy, it's just blowing that big iceberg right into the bay here. It's got me locked down. I can't get the canoe in the water to uh, move and get closer to the fresh water. And uh, it's gotten pretty cold, so... Wind can blow like this for weeks. And at this stage, no boat can come back here and get me. In the Arctic, the land and weather just are. You can either handle it or you can't. And taking chances is a fool's game. Right now, no safety crew could get to me if they wanted to. And with polar bears around, taking a chance on survival is exactly what I'm doing. The wind is coming in way too strong for me to stand out here and try to do any fishing to get some food. It's brutally cold coming in off the Arctic Ocean. I'd be chilled to the bone in no time. Now that iceberg way down in the corner is the size of an office tower. And eight hours ago, it was many miles down that way. Yet over the course of the time, while I was hunkered down in that little shack, it was blown right, ac right across the bay. That's how strong this wind is. And it's cold. For now, I'm going to head inland just a little bit, get a drink of water from a nearby stream. There's a river down that way. And then come back in and hunker down. That's all I can do is wait out this wind, because I can't travel. I can't put the canoe in the water and get out of here. It capsized in seconds. Unlike a lot of places I've been, Giardia is not very prevalent in the Arctic. The water is all fresh and clean coming straight from glaciers. With water looked after, I can concentrate on trying for some food. In colder temperatures, the need for food escalates. My energy is depleted much faster while I deal with the wind and the cold. Well, I might as well try switching lures for a while anyway. This one's not working. I tried scouting around by the river to see if there was a spot in behind a ridge that I could get protected from this wind. And it's not so bad. There's a few spots, but it's still pretty windy there. Instead, I think I know a way I can make my shelter a little warmer. In fact, I think I can get a fire going. Ingenuity is always the mother of survival. Once I started looking around with an eye towards surviving, it's amazing what small items, man-made or natural, that there are. They can help to improve my situation. Well, I don't look so surprised. There's not a ocean side in the world that I've been to yet that doesn't have refuse on it.
Oh, hopefully that'll work. Now I just have to try and get a fire going without matches here. Focus. There we go. Now it's focused. With very little effort at all, I'm able to walk around this old fish camp, and there's all kinds of little slivers of wood, bits of plastic, and I don't have to put much effort into it, just have to gather it up, bring it over here, and I've got a good fire bundle. Of course, now I need to have the fire. All right, this is a CB radio. Right now, it's not the radio that I want. It's the battery from the radio. It's a little 12-volt battery. This is what I need. Well, scored a couple of things when I went over and looked in that big 45-gallon drum full of junk. There was old cups and teapots and tons of metal cans, but also old dish scrubbers and steel wool. And with this and this battery, I can make fire. I just have to touch the steel wool to those two terminals and it should ignite for me. All right, well, wish me luck. Touch it to this terminal here. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Let's get it under there. Ah. <laughs> that is nice. Woo! Boy, if any place I needed a fire, it's here in the Arctic. And that worked like a charm. Just about every place on the planet has an ancient and primitive people's history. The Arctic shares its history easily, as it can be thousands of years before items biodegrade and vanish from existence. This mound here is a couple of thousand years old. The Thule Indians first lived out here, and this is what they made. Big sawed circles. The camera's actually in a lower circle, and then there's the entranceway down even lower. Come into one, come into the other, and over top would be whale rib bones and uh, caribou hide. And that would make their shelter, which would be a heck of a lot warmer than the plywood crate I'm sleeping in. And all this area here is obviously where they harvested the sod from to make the mounds in the first place. Pull out of one area, drop it down right beside it, and make your mound. There are places where you can take the time to affect your survival, like in the tropics. But up here, the land offers no forgiveness. It's indifferent to whether you live or die. I should have moved. It was uh, a calm wind for a few hours, and uh, which I slept through, fortunately. So that helps to get some sleep, but the wind has picked up incredibly now, and uh, huh, it's raining. I think what I'll have to do is put on my big orange survival suit and uh, get the heck out of Dodge, which means going across the river, going across the rapids in a fold-up canoe. All right, I'm packed up. It's probably going to take me a couple of hours and, uh, and a few trips since I have to take the canoe as well. And that's the easy part of the trip. After that, I've got to negotiate the rapids. They're only class one rapids. They're, they're no big deal, just little, little riffles, but the water is frigid cold and everything I have to survive with will be in that canoe. So one wrong move and uh, I could be in a lot of trouble. But first, hike. At least hiking overland in the Arctic is not as tough as pushing through thick bush. And although in most Arctic regions the mosquitoes can carry you away, here on Baffin Island, there are relatively few bugs to bother me. I was expecting to have to cross this river at a much more dangerous spot up ahead with rapids. But here, I didn't spot this before. It's quite low. Obviously, I can walk across without any issue at all. I'm at low tide right now as well, so I've got to get the rest of my stuff across before uh, the water level picks up. It sure pays to look around and play it safe. If I were to dump here in the water with everything I've got, it'd be a very dangerous situation. This is, after all, the Arctic. Always got to come back for the camera. Okay, so this is the section that I have to get across now, and that's nothing. I can scoot across that without any issue at all. I got another uh, 
bit of a distance to carry all my gear before I get to uh, what looks like some old fish camp. There's a bunch of 45 gallon drums over there. So I'm going to put the camera away so it doesn't get wet, hop in the canoe, get across there and get onto the camp, hopefully before it rains. Uh, this was a heck of a lot easier than hiking it over. Nothing like canoeing. Yeah, I think I'll pull off here without ending up in the ocean. The trick is, the river meanders all over the place and if you get caught down one current, you get taken way out of the way. So, I'm just sort of hug the right side here and make my way over to this side of the river. With any luck, the fishing will be better over here too. Since I was filming in the river, the rain came in pretty hard and uh, I had to sit here for about a half an hour while it pelted down on me. Now there's sunshine over in that part of the sky, which is great. Unfortunately, the part of the sky that's still coming towards me is still white with rain. Now, I gotta make this home. And I've gotta get some food. I'm stuck here with a bunch of metal drums. Well, so much for that. I spent all the time going across land and then across the river and then across a little bit more land to get to here. And in the span of time that it took for me to do all of that, the ocean calmed down. So I could have just waited, got in the canoe, and actually just got in the ocean and paddled around to this site. It just shows you, you cannot you know, take chances on the weather. It's, it's really difficult. So as it is right now, I mean, I, I'd like to start throwing a line in and see if I can catch some Arctic char. But that doesn't mean that this blue sky isn't going to leave me in 45 minutes. So what I better do first is get a shelter put up here. Then I can start trying for some food. One man's toxic sludge is another man's potpourri. It's not so bad. Well, that gives me uh, a place to get into when it starts raining again. Once again, with my shelter looked after, I can turn my efforts towards getting food. Wind has picked up again. Unbelievable, did not take long at all. I had about an hour of calm, calm weather here. Now the wind's coming right in on me and that's a cold wind. Taking a couple of liters here, strung them together. A couple of small hooks on the bottom. Some bear hooks, bear hooks, bear hooks. All I have to do now is put some bait on it. Some whale blubber, a couple of small hooks. With any luck, the seagull will just go for a big gulp. Now what I'll do is I'll take this blubber and I'm gonna rub it around everywhere because, oops, not all, all over me, because that scent is gonna bring, it's gonna bring the seagulls in. Now these traps can be very effective. It's uh, about 80 yards or so from my shelter. That shouldn't scare the seagulls much. Hopefully they'll come in and I'll have myself a bird dinner. All right, now I gotta get fishing. Birds and their eggs, wild edibles, all of them are great survival food, but nothing equals the advantage of having actual fishing tackle to catch the large arctic char. Catching fish with improvised bits of string and pins bent into hooks is an extremely rare bit of situational luck in usually extremely harsh and challenging situations. Fishing tackle for me now is no longer recreational equipment. It's survival gear. 
I've been fishing for a few hours without a single bite, and uh, I've seen birds, seagulls all around me ever since I first got out here, and yet, uh, <laughs> as soon as I put the bait out, I haven't seen a single bird. You know, maybe if I blow a little bit of harp, it'll change my luck. See if I can get a bit of sleep. Quarters are a little tight compared to uh, the last shelter, but in fact, with any luck at all, they won't be as windy. And uh, I think I should be fine for rain as well. I think I'll be alright in here. As long as it doesn't get too windy. <laughs> Who am I kidding? This is Baffin Island. It's always too windy. Good thing about that bird trap and any traps that you leave is that they work when you aren't working. So if I hear a bird squawking, maybe that will be uh, dinner for me. Loneliness seems intensified in the Arctic with its long and foreboding expanses that wrap around all of your senses. I'm finding now that uh, my lack of food, this is four days without food now, it's really uh, wreaking havoc on my energy levels. It changes all the time, uh, depending on where I, I try to survive. But when I have to survive in cold and wind and rain, it just depletes the energy levels that much faster and makes things a little tougher to deal with. So I'm going to put in a concerted effort at trying to catch some fish now. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to have to head in, inland and uh, see what I can do. Just the act of walking to check a trap can suck the energy right out of me. You know, the craziest thing, now it's four days without food, all this cold, fresh air. Dreams are just becoming extremely vivid. Wow, just way whacked out, wild and crazy dreams. Never happens at home to get out here without any food in your stomach. And all the aloneness, the big expanse, and uh, the fresh air, and you just get these intense dreams. Also getting pretty down, actually. Dreams are kind of like an escape. Feeling a little down. Man, nothing. That's a shame. I haven't put a big hunk on top without a hook in it that if they wanted, they could have just taken, and they haven't, they haven't even touched it. That's really strange. I threw a couple of pieces out on the ground before. There's some down here on the ground, and I watched them come in and eat it. This thing's been sitting here for 24 hours, and they haven't touched it. That's a bummer. All right. Back to fishing. Cold, wind, a lack of wild edibles. It's a tougher one. These kinds of temperatures in the gray sky, very little blue, play on the psyche. Many people have perished because they missed the caribou migration by about a week up here in the Arctic. I'm probably about two weeks early on the Arctic char running up this river, and uh, I'm paying for it with an empty belly. When it comes to luck in survival, it's all about the timing. One month, one week, even one day can make the difference between life and death by starvation. Timing is everything. I've been trying for days to catch some fish for survival, and I took the chance on throwing a line in just now while the narwhal were forcing the char close to the shore and right past my lures. Oh, 
going anywhere, buddy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Come here. Right. Okay, I'm gonna keep fishing. If you watch in the background, there's a narwhal going right by me here. Maybe that's what's chasing all the Arctic char in and why I'm able to catch them. It's because there's narwhal out there trying to feed on them. You know, the irony to this is that I wasn't even going to come back and fish right now. I was getting so disillusioned with all the fishing. I was just going to hike the fields and start gathering a lot of edibles. <laughs> I don't even know where my fishing rod went. That was a big one. Oh yeah, and no word of a lie, this is how I caught him. First this guy, then to that guy, then I cut that guy, and then finally that big mama. Check it out. This is a good day. This is a good day. I am one hungry boy, let me tell you. It's been uh, four and a half days now, and uh, I could use some nourishment. Time to get some. Understanding some traditional food preserving techniques can save a ton of food from perishing and ensure survival. I split the fish like this. Now I've got to put some slices in the fish so that it can air out. If I slice in straight, they tend to fall together. So I've got to slice on an angle so they fall, the little, all the little sections will fall, fall open and then dry better. Fresh sushi. <laughs> Man. Can't get sushi this fresh in LA. One thing I love to eat on fish and not too many people save is the liver. I find the liver and the heart the tastiest part of the fish. So I'm gonna save the liver and the heart and eat those up. Ha <laughs> Eating the fish roast, fantastic. Caviar, basically. Mm. Highly nutritious. Look at this guy. See those right there? That's where some other fish, maybe a seal, has gone after this fish and tried to catch him and eat him. And he got away. But he didn't get away from me. So I will honor you, buddy, by eating you. Of course, now the possibility of polar bear coming is going to be that much stronger with all this uh, fish smell, whale blubber smell all around my camp. No eggs in this one, but a nice big liver. So I'm going to have to be extremely diligent watching out for polar bear. That's three. Last one. The beast. 
<laughs> Sweet. More eggs. Number four. Four reasons why fishing tackle is vital in a survival kit. Normally, a lot of this stuff would go to waste, but in a survival situation, that's definitely not the case. First of all, I've got all these fillets here that are cut away that I'm gonna cook up and enjoy. Got liver, which is my favorite, some fish hearts. And what's left of the fish there, there's a ton of raw meat on it that I'm gonna pick away and, and just eat raw now and enjoy. The fish eyes go in for soup if I had a pot, which I don't have a pot, so I can just eat all of that raw. And then lastly, all the intestines, well, I'll be able to use them to add to my uh, bird trap over there because they don't seem to be coming in for the last little bits of uh, whale blubber that I put out, so fine. I'll put out some of this fish. There's a seagull right now. Out and see if I can uh, get myself a bird to add to the feast. But for now, speaking of feasts, I'm gonna go get a fire going and continue with my fish feast. <laughs> this is killer. Measure of a good outdoor guide. If they can get a fire going for you after three days of solid rain. That is a good guide. And of course, if they pull out some chocolate and some scotch or wine, well, <laughs> then they're master guides. Having fire in this area is a luxury afforded me by the refuse left behind by people fishing here. All right. Magic. A little steel wool, one battery, and we've got fire. Fresh cooked Arctic char. Mmm. Wow. <laughs> That's unbelievable. You know, right now, my editor's watching this and thinking, man, I wish I was there. Catching them jar and eating them too. Oh, it's good. Right, Barry? Oh, that's so good. The reality is now that I'm here to film a show about survival. But the fact is, we're so far out in the north edge of Baffin Island that anything could go wrong. And it could be that these four fish I caught are going to be desperately needed, not only for me, but also for my safety crew. If we get trapped here and can't get out by boat, helicopter, or plane, food will run out, and catching fish may be what keeps us all in survival. It wouldn't be the first time that uh, a film crew has been uh, stranded somewhere remote. Oh, and here comes the rain. I gotta go. And that's what you look like to me. You look like a camera. Arctic char liver. Hmm. Tender and tasty. Hmm. Oh, I'm getting full. Uh, I think it stopped raining. Just because I now have the bounty of fish doesn't mean that I shouldn't see what else I have available to eat. Those, after all, could be the last fish I catch. There's hundreds and hundreds of these plants all around. I haven't got a clue what this plant is called. All I know from learning from an Inuit hunter that the root is very edible. And there's hundreds, maybe thousands of these plants all over the hillsides. This plant, which actually there's lots of it around my camp. This is the traditional burnable material. Now I'm fortunate in that there's all that leftover scrap wood that I've been able to burn and have a full on fire. 
But if I didn't have that, this plant burns fantastically. In fact, I do have a stash of this back at the camp for uh, when I run out of scrap wood or through the night just to keep the fire going. Okay, here's some more wild edible plants. Beautiful. Mmm, and tart too. These hillsides here are just carpeted with wild edible plants. So I've got wild edibles, fire starting material, arctic jar on the ocean coast, and the irony is that this has one of the harshest climates on the planet. And you'd think that it would be the toughest to survive here. And true enough, outside of a short two month span, it is extremely hard survival here. But right now, there's some bounty that I can take advantage of and um, plenty of it, if you know what you're looking for. The warmth of food digesting in my belly helps to keep the chills out of my body. You know one of the main components of survival is luck. I had fully intended on spending the day inland searching for wild edibles and hunting for ptarmigan. And it was just by chance that I realized I forgot something, so I came back to the camp. And while I was here, I thought, ah, water's nice and calm, the tide's nice and high. Maybe I'll try casting the lure in a couple of times and see what happens. And bam, you saw the results. So as much as you need to be in shape, as much as you should have a survival kit, and you certainly must have the mental faculties to survive. You have to have that will to live. But also, sometimes, to survive, all you need is a lot of luck. And today, I got lucky. I sure hope no polar bear come around with all that fish gut smell everywhere. Morning of day five, trapped again by the rain. No surprise there. Anyway, fire's still going, so that's good. That was set up well, and I've got lots of food, so I'm okay that way. I have no idea whether or not a fire will attract a polar bear or keep a polar bear away. I'm gonna hope for the latter. Without a windbreak from trees, without land features to stop the windy onslaught, without a well-made constructed shelter, being trapped in by the wind and rain in the Arctic is unequaled. Four hours, it's still raining. That's it. That's been my view for uh, five hours now. Lovely view, isn't it? Well, what everybody's doing at home right now. Probably having a hot drink somewhere. Watching TV. <coughs> Maybe they're watching Survivor Man. stretching. Six hours, and it's still raining. Seven hours, and it's still misting slash raining. Good thing that there's a lot of scrap lumber lying around here. Eight and a half hours, and it's raining again. Getting about time I do something, rain or no rain. One way I can make sure I don't lose a fire is to kind of put together a makeshift kudluk here. Got some of this, uh, it's the last of the whale blubber. I was using it as a uh, bait for the seagulls, but instead I'm going to make an oil lamp out of it. If you just scrape the whale blubber, it just juices out grease and oil. 
Oops. Watch I don't dull up my knife. So I'll show you what I mean here. So all right now. This is just an old sock that was laying around here, so I've been drying it. And I'm gonna take a piece of it. Soak it up into this oil. There we go. Okay, see that? I'll put that in a little protected place and that should burn a good long time for me. You could still come in to rain on me here, but it's a little bright spot in the sky up there, so who knows? About nine hours of waiting out the rain. The weather has blown in really strong and uh, I radioed into the safety crew and it looks like we're just going to have to pull out of here tomorrow. The weather keeps coming in and battering us and uh, we don't want to get to be one of those situations where we're locked down for a week. Just got to get through this last night. But it is, uh, the weather's just socked us right in. It's all just gray, misty and blowing in from the ocean side. The wind and the rain continue to change the Arctic viewscape. I had lost a few days at the beginning of this Arctic venture, and now the return and repeat of the harsh weather is shutting down the chute and forcing the safety crew and I to head back to the protection of the small Arctic village we originally left from. But with my full belly of Arctic char, thanks to having fishing tackle as survival gear, I've been able to affect my best survival ever in a place above all others that is probably the most beautiful when it comes to the landscape and yet the harshest when it comes to survival.